I feel like after spending 40 minutes absolutely laying into Ted Lasso, I'm after like just kicking a puppy. So I, I want to talk about more happy stuff. I want to redeem myself. Um, And we're going to discuss as such a brand new release. Uh, this week, we saw the huge blockbuster release of Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. Um, and there's only one way I want to discuss this because ladies and gentlemen, we've just moved on from, obviously we've had uh, a few weeks with the disgusting brother, my diamond dog partner, uh, Tom. He's now exiting stage left because we are entering the summer of the one and only the spider punk to my spider ham it is dan lynham uh very welcome to uh page 180 back to discuss uh across the spider verse dan you must have been absolutely buzzing i know spider spider man is your guy so this must have been uh you must have been high up on the height scale the spider man's my guy and i've been very very harsh on the other spider movies in the past Dang. and we know both of us are big spider verse fans uh so this is going to be an interesting one and well, without saying too much for starter, man, that was a Spider-Man movie made for Spider-Man fans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait. And, and like, this is very hot off the take. So by the time you guys would have heard this, hopefully a, a few years would have gotten out to see it. But we are coming, like, literally, Dan was in the cinema a couple hours ago. Um, Just I saw it. Yeah, I saw it last night. So we this is fresh out of the take, hot takes. Um, and We haven't kind of heard, like, been able to kind of dip too much into the discourse or anything. Um, But I think we're fairly good to say that uh, a lot of people are enjoying this. And, and spoiler earth we are among them so let's talk about uh, across the spider verse guys there's going to be spoilers from here on out we are into the spoiler verse as well as the spider verse so please be careful i am again giving you time to throw away your phone to press pause and get away from it if you haven't seen it go see the movie first because if you don't you're going to get spoiled if you're staying on with us then i presume you're okay with spoilers do not get into my mentions given out to me you have been given fair warning but first before we get into our conversation we're going to put ourselves back into the move and recap where we are uh, with our alt recap as we always do for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and meanwhile on Earth 65 Gwen Stacy is being pursued by her cop father who's unaware that she's Spider-Woman at least until a run-in with a blue Garfield renaissance remix of Vulture Miguel O'Hara his superpower is bamboozling you into trying to figure out what stereotype he's supposed to represent and Jessica Drew sees her reveal her identity and forced to abandon her universe as this movie didn't up and left you crying before the open credits even rolled uh, back on Earth 1610 Miles is grounded and show, for showing up late to his dad's party after getting in a fight with the villain of the week who might just do a Richmond and threaten to win the whole damn thing in the spot. Gwen shows up and discovers Miles is a little incel a little bit who spent the last year drawing her picture over and over again but she's very chill about it all to be fair mainly because she's not there for Miles as he discovers while invisible and is there to track down Spot. I hate when the girl you have a crush on uses you for your proximity to a universe altering supervillain. It's just the worst. Uh, Miles continues his incel behavior and follows her to Mumbatton in Earth 50101 where they encounter some of the spider society including Spider-Man India, uh, Privta, Prav, 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 oh that didn't go well at all, Spider-Punk, I got there, Spider-Punk, <laughs> Hobie Brown, uh, newly made girl dad Peter B. Parker and O'Hara who childs Miles, Miles for helping destruct the universe by disrupting a canon event. To be fair, who among us in our teens did risk disrupting the universe to try cannon someone's event. It's only natural, Miles. Don't beat yourself up. Uh, Miles learns that his dad dying at the hands of the spot uh, is to be a cannon event for him and O'Hara sends the entire Spider-Verse chasing him, being a bit of a dick and pointing out that he was never supposed to be Spider-Man in the process. O'Hara would be just the worst doctor with that bedside manner. Unfortunately, Miles, your father has mere hours to live and also, by the way, nobody likes you. It's like, you, you can't be doing that. Like, he's got an up on his plate. After an epic chase Miles manages to escape home but this time Gwen is the one following him there he confesses to his mother that he's Spider-Man but she's never even heard of Spider-Man it was only when his uncle Aaron arrived that he realised he was in Earth 42 the place where there was no Spider-Man because the radioactive spider from there bit him instead and he encountered the prowler of this universe aka Miles freaking Morales but with braids uh, meanwhile Gwen is left in Earth 1610 where she realises he's not there awkwardly trying to explain to his parents why she's in his room she went with the whole oh 
Miles loves you so much, Routine, which was a solid deflection, to be fair. Uh, with our Miles at the mercy of the Prowler, Miles and Aaron, Gwen assembles a crew of sympathetic Spideys, including some return characters from the original, as we get those dreaded words you never want to hear when there's a Hollywood writer strike delaying all productions. To be continued. And if getting the payoff to this doesn't convince Hollywood to pay their fucking writers, I don't know what will. That was Across the Spider Verse. Dan, I've been dying. I, I want to set the mm -hmm. scene first because I've been dying to chat about this with you, but I want to kind of get a feel because obviously we're watching it like as it opens. Last night I was in such a buzz. It was an opening night crowd. And again, like, you know, Into the Spider Verse kind of gained a following. And it's one of those things that kind of gained a following as it went on and got momentum. And as rewatches came in and as people streamed it, they watched it. And now it's an absolute phenomenon, but purely on like word of mouth and just through sheer quality alone. My screening was absolutely packed. It was full of Spider-Man fans. Again, you're nervous when there's a packed screening like that, that there's going to be one fucking arsehole who can't help but ruin it. But everyone was bought in. Everyone was popping for every single line. It was absolutely awesome atmosphere. Uh, what was your atmosphere like? How was it for you watching on opening weekend? What was your experience? Very much so like that the first... Uh, viewing that I had there was a lot of people's uh, there were a lot of fans there we had like because we went in the middle of the day there was a lot of kids there was a lot of family but we that didn't deter from anything I want to give a special shout out to the kid that was beside me and if you and the chance you're watching this uh, if you were in Blanchard Sound this morning if you were sitting at F9 <laughs> in the IMAX screen uh, you entertained me as much as the movie did itself. So I'd like to give you a personal thank you. <laughs> Clearly the dude, he's been reading comics for that golden period of six months, to the point where he realizes this is the thing he loves more than life itself. And he has read everything in the past two weeks. And he was telling his mates the entire time, every single bit, tip, bit of information that was going on, as well as overreacting to absolutely everything. No, I heard, ne I didn't hear as many for fuck's sakes in my life as I had. <laughs> Until I saw the Matrix back in 1999, <laughs> it was it was on par with that, with people touching the walls when they were leaving the cinema, not realizing reality was an inconvenience. Now, <laughs> this guy was absolutely so entertaining. But the overall buzz of the cinema was great. When I went to see No Way Home, it was the same deal. Loads of great interaction. It felt very much like an American cinema, and this was the same deal as well. There was gasps and oh my gods ringing out from the entire cinema the whole time. And I love that. Some people think that like you want to go and indulge in a movie, sit at home and watch it, wait for it to come out. If you want a proper fan, community, crowd interaction, go to the cinema and watch it as soon as it starts because I really enjoyed the interaction. Movie, absolute pile of dog shit, really disappointed. It is the <laughs> furthest off from my uh, from my like mind right now because it was absolutely yes. brilliant. Yes. Yes. Very and much so. And, and and this is the thing, like, and, and we're both very much the same speed. Into the Spider Verse was, though, for many people, their favorite Spider Man. So it had yeah. huge expectations. So we both loved the movie, but do you feel that it lived up to the expectations? Where do you feel it kind of stands in contrast to Into the Spider Spider Verse? Because what I'm hearing in the little bit of buzz I've been able to digest in the kind of you know a few hours since I've seen the movie is that people are almost conflicted. They're like. I love that movie, but is this better? Are, are you? Do you have that conflict, or do you have a clear favorite, or how yeah. did this way up compared to compared to the original? I'm conflicted now because I'm right high on the buzz of coming out of cinema, haven't watched it. So right now, I am in the best uh, in the right frame of mind to say yes or no. But at the moment, going on pure emotion, I preferred it for a number of different factors, uh, but it's very close. Mm -hmm. Um. We watched we watched um last night with the original one and we wanted to go in what haven't seen both and back to back. I really do enjoy doing that when there's big sequels coming up. Mm. And uh, I think the best way to sum this up was this very much felt like the Back to the Future two of the Spider Man franchise. In many ways, biggest thing which I kind of realized in the last fifteen minutes, having no idea of this going in. This is going to be a to-be-continued scenario. Yeah. There's too much to unpack here. There's been too much happening in the last few minutes, which we'll obviously get into in itself. And with the way they were telling the story, it was like, they've wrapped this story up now, and we've a lot to tell. This is a very solid part two. But just like Back to the Future 2, which is my favorite of, the, of that franchise, yeah. 
it just that movie just stands out, even though it ends on such a cliffhanger. It's gonna. I think. It, I think it's gonna be this generation's version of that. It's yeah. Miles taking out the Predator mask at the end, realizing he's in the wrong universe, is going to be the "I'm back, I'm back from the future." Great Scott moments uh, of this whole franchise of Spider-Man movies. Love it. Uh, another thing, it's getting a lot of comparisons to is Empire Strikes Back, which is like people saying it's this generation's like it's the Luke, I am your father. It's got that kind of like the sequel outdoing the original in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. For me, I thought this was half of an absolutely perfect movie. Uh, this had me smiling from the get-go and you knew from the opening sequence that we were in safe hands. And that's what I love when you have directors who just like ease you straight away. And it's like, sit back, enjoy. We got this, you know? And you could just feel that. The only kind of small nitpick I had at the start that left me a bit uneasy. And it was nothing to do with the movie, the story, the characters, the actors, anything to do with it. It was just the sound mixing. I don't know if it was the same in your movie. I could barely hear Gwen talk at times because the drums were so loud at the start. And there was a couple of scenes like that where the background music kind of the background music kind of drowned out the voiceover. Um, and again, I I've seen a couple of people online saying that it was so I'm like, okay, it wasn't just the screening I was in. Although I kind of wish it was just the screening because I'd, I'd love to rewatch it and so on. But it's the only tiny nitpick that I could have. Everything else was just absolutely nailed. The comedy was fantastic, hilarious, and they won up mm. the kind of comedy from the first one. The animation, which I want to kind of talk about specifically with you, is next level. The action sequences were thrilling. The story was perhaps the best world multiverse story i've seen outside of everything everywhere all at once i'm not even saying that movie is better it's just the only thing i can compare and it's on the same level as this and i loved the idea of them getting really meta and challenging the idea that canon is this immovable object and kind of going mm. you know what like again it's it's getting meta into like this is the the story behind the story and this is actually how creators feel when it comes to these comic books where it's like you ruin everything if you mess with canon and then you have miles being like no, you don't. We can actually mess with canon. And I love that as well. And at a certain, they haven't really even got into that that much. They've just set up that premise. But it's such a promising setup for uh, part two. Uh, because obviously they're going to get in really deep with that metaphor and kind of let us know. They made the tone shift so natural throughout this because they just had you by the balls. And again, it was just, I'd say this was like, the, the, the way I left this was, in terms of superhero movies, I left this going, this is... This is like Infinity War uh, because it's just like the perfect first movie setting up what I'm confident is going to be an amazing second movie. Is it all? Is it like? Is it as good or better than Infinity War? I I don't know, but Infinity War and and Endgame are like two of my top twenty movies of all time. So the fact that I'm having the conversation with myself constantly yeah. and that's the question I keep coming back to: Is this Infinity War? Is it that level? That just shows how much I love this movie. I adored it. It was fantastic. They nailed it. Um, loved it. Loved it. Loved it. So let's get in deep. Obviously, uh, some listeners may not know, but if they're watching on video in particular and looking in the background, they may be able to tell. You're quite the artiste yourself. Uh, you've a history of kind of drawing and animation and, and design and so on. So I want to get your thoughts. There were six different kind of animation styles uh, being used here. What was your kind of initial reactions with some of the animations? What were the things that stood out to you and seeing it with that kind of insider eye? The best thing I think for that was what they captured is that they can't really do in live action because it would rely on a lot of CG, which once again can shut down suspension of disbelief because it's animated. The web singing scenes were absolutely fantastic. I mean, a lot of people ache in certain scenes in movies. I think of, once again, make a second re uh, Matrix reference, the Agent Smith fight scene in the second Matrix. It's too much like watching a computer game. Mm. Whereas you take the Spider-Man computer games and the web singing in those is so... The cinematography is fantastic, even though you're just playing a game. They they brought that over very successfully via the animation style into the movie, and it was by far one of the most exciting parts of it. One thing that it really irks me in both comics and comic book movies is sometimes you lose out on the action and the excitement of the film to just make way for story and stuff like that. But when you get it right in both mediums, you have this fantastic collaboration between action and emotion which this movie did really well. A beautiful sequence of scenes, because it wasn't just one scene in my mind, was about Miles and Gwen, uh, their initial web swinging when Gwen joins him in his universe as they're going through the city and like kind of just like reconnecting, which ends in that scene when they're on top of the New York Bank building. 
And that's something you can't do in live action because it require huge amounts of CG, which I think takes the audience out. And then you don't have that like artistic interpretation you can have in this because of its style of animation. It is very cartoony. Um, a lot of the characters can be very unnaturally elongated, which adds to the Todd McFarlane style of drawing Spider-Man, who really invented that acrobatic ballerina sort of posing that that was in the comics heavily in the in the 90s in Spider-Man. And that was brought perfectly into this. They tried to do it in some of the other movies and it seemed a little bit hokey, especially in the Tobey Maguire ones, where he just looks like he's trying to scratch an itch in a very, very difficult to reach position. But in this, because of the animation style, it worked perfectly. Um, so web slinging is going to be number one. Use of colors is number two, especially when it came to Gwen's universe. Her her meeting back up with her father was brilliant. The use of dark colors, and then when the revelation came out about that, they're the same character with different like courses. How they how they get to their end goal. And that she basically always just wanted to be her version of her father. And the way they use colors in those scenes with the animation, which you, once again, you could never achieve properly in live action, was like on a masterclass level. Um, it felt like, I remember a review in Star Wars Visions Volume 2 there a few weeks ago. It felt like the entire series of that in one. Because what I loved about this was just the blend of the animation. You know what I mean? It wasn't just that they had this, but like the work that went into this. Like I read this when I was doing research alone. For Spider-Punk's visuals, th that alone took three years to perfect. Like that is the detail and level of work that's going into this. I love that as well. And it kind of harkens back to the first episode of the scene in particular that you're referring to, especially when she goes home and has the reunion with her father. And mm. it's kind of tinged in this sadness, regret and everything else. And they use the color palette to kind of define it. It reminds me of the first episode of Visions Volume 2, where the coloring is a character in it. And that tells the story of the emotion. Uh, but again, like in a way where if you did it in live, action it'd be cheesy it'd be hokey and again just to kind of yes and what you're saying there in terms of um the things you can get away with in, in animation that you can't i think a testament to that is that in every live action feature of spider-man they eventually have to convolute an explanation for how the webbing works whereas mm -hmm. we never do that in animation it just never comes up because we don't care it doesn't look realistic it doesn't require an explanation and we can just go with it but what i love about what spider-verse is doing is it is making all that palatable to a large mainstream audience and they're making a fuckload of money in a way that you know, you look at Batman, for example, and Batman, there's an awful lot of Batman, which the best stories are actually probably gated behind a lot of the animated universe, similar to Star Wars as well. Animation mm -hmm. is sometimes where they'll really get in deep. But again, it doesn't attract that mainstream audience. This is doing both. And this is like game changing to what it does in the industry and what it does for animation as well. So I think it really, I'm, I think it needed to be the first thing that we called out because the work and the energy and everything that went into it and how it set the tone for the story literally um, was, was phenomenal. I also want to give props to Hayley Steinfeld, who is absolutely cleaning up on Marvel money uh, as Hawkeye now and also mm -hmm. as Gwen. And like in Hawkeye, both Marvel Studios and Sony are, are very much like, do you know what? Will we just make Haley the star? Because she's absolutely great. <laughs> and she was the person who opened this movie and she was the one narrating and kind of going, all right, let's do this again. And like that throwback to the original movie. What were your thoughts on Gwen taking a more central role from the opening scene? Because now it's almost as if it's not just the Miles Morales story. It's it's Miles and Gwen. It's near 50-50. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's 50-50. I'd say it's more 60-40 Miles, but she's very much... A main character now like so what were your thoughts on, on, on that just to i for my thoughts on when being a genuine spider-man fan for the entire time when i bought my first ever spider-man comic it was one during what a lot of fans see as one of the worst parts of one of the worst stories which was the clone saga being a kid i absolutely loved it and i remember one of my first comics is when they tried to reintroduce one of the first iterations of gwen which is universally seen as an absolute crap fest so we go back to the original Death of Gwen Stacy story, which is absolutely iconic. And the fact that they tried to bring her back several times in the comics alone and missed the boat massively uh, with the Jackal bringing her back in the Clone Saga with uh, the Norman Osborn's twins scenario. And then when it came to the Ultimate Spider-Man, 
uh, the 616 tie-ins and, and then, of course, uh, the Spider-Verse story, which I plot behind me just to show that, <laughs> like, I think this is what, this is, like, basically what I feel they pull a lot of its ideas from. I think, though, if you're to take the entire Spider-Man universe as one medium, which it kind of is now because of a lot of the universe building they did in this movie, to reconnect every single Spider-Man franchise that ever existed from the Japanese ones to the toys alone, like, in their own canon universe uh to like what we have with gwen stacy now i think finally they've realized what they can do with the gwen stacy character because even as spider gwen in the comics it sometimes it feels like it's pandering to the fans it's trying to bring people in but they really realize their full potential in this movie even more so than the first one so i love it being a fan of a lot of the Silver Age stuff in the comics. The death of Gwen Stacy is one of the biggest stories of all time, and it's an absolute heartbreaking one. So I just think they absolutely nailed what they've done with her in this movie, and I will be first in line if they ever decide to do a standalone Spider-Gwen movie. Yeah, and, and who knows, we could get it. And, and Haley is mm-hmm. absolutely phenomenal in that role too. Um, and just makes it, again... Very similar to Hawkeye because there is something to be said for Marvel does have a responsibility to kind of balance things out as far as gender, as far as race, as far as different representation. And with that, the risk is there's an element of tokenism. But where Haiti is great in both her Marvel roles is she's so good that like no one's like, no, she deserves to be there. She's amazing. Um, So she carries that, but also it does have the effect of kind of, I remember listening to an interview, it was actually with Social Democrats leader Holly Carnes, and she was going, oh, I just wish there was a fe- there was like a female Spider-Man, it'd be great. And it's like, there is. And now it's mm. like- and now- There has been several. Yeah, and, and like there is. But like, again, if you're like kind of a surface level Spider-Man fan, if you watch the Tom Holland and Tobey Maguire movies and stuff, and that's your, that's Spider-Man to you, you may not know that. But now yeah. people know it and, and it works and it fits, but it doesn't come across as, as exploitative, it doesn't cross, come across as pandering or tokenistic, uh, just because Hayley Steinfeld nails it. The, the inverse of that is that the more when we get, the less miles we get. And he did take a step back here, and there is that element of miles as a character is lost, which for me is a great plot device because it just gives him a, a hill to climb. Like beyond the Spider Verse is going to be very much about him finding and accepting his true identity. He is literally told that he doesn't belong on several times mm-hmm. uh, throughout this movie. Is chased out of the Spider Verse. Uh, he doesn't have a home because he doesn't fit within his own Earth, but he doesn't fit within the Spider Verse among his peers because they don't see him as a peer. So again, that sets up beyond the Spider-Verse perfectly. But as a result, we have a Miles that's very lost in the shuffle now internally, not in a, I don't say this in a terms of criticizing the plot, but that's his monologue and that's where his, his, his mind frame is at. How did that sit with you? Because it is a massive shift from where we left the first movie where it's like, he's the hero now. We pretty much had 20 minutes of him being a competent Spider-Man and then he was back into disarray. Do you feel that that was effective or would you rather kind of more time with the miles that we left him as at the end into the Spider-Verse? I think it's very smart in the Spider-Man canon as it is because that has always been, no matter what Spider-Man you go for, whether it be Peter Parker, Ben Riley, or Miles Morales, you have... um, a Spider-Man that doesn't fit into the status quo has always been the backbone of the stories. I mean, that's what Stanley said when he wrote it. He wanted to approach it as a superhero with real world issues, which he was chastised for. So in a universe or a dimension, I guess you put it, of Spider-Man, you have to have the core protagonist as being the outsider. So I just think it's a very clever way of doing it, having him the outside Spider-Man, having him as uh, not necessarily the renegade, but the outcast. Like what um, Miguel said to him was that, you know, you never should have existed. Um, so I think what they've done is so clever because it's so obvious. So I'm a big fan of it because Spider-Man works because he does reflect everyone's, that moment in your life when you're a teenager or a young adult, where you really don't feel like you fit in. So to be the one Spider-Man that doesn't fit in with every conceivable Spider-Man is the smartest way to tell the story. Yeah, very true. Um, And in a similar way, the movie's villain 
there's kind of a, a reflective aspect towards Miles in the spot of someone who, who doesn't fit in. Um, I love as well how he was the guy who got bageled. That was such a nice touch because that's such a, as soon as they brought up that moment, it's it's the moment that you don't necessarily think of from the first movie. But as soon as you mm-hmm. see it, you're like, yeah, everyone knows it, yeah. everyone remembers it. It sticks in your head because it's so iconic. It's such a meme. I love that little reference, but it, it's, it's also like, again, they joked about how he was the villain of the week and now he is threatening the entire multiverse, uh, bringing it down. Yeah. Um, what were your thoughts? Because that's quite an elevation for for the spot. Because again, like in the comics, and again, this is kind of again challenging that narrative of canon doesn't need to be canon. Um, but he was very much a villain of the week for for the comics, and now that he's kind of elevated to being the villain for Spider Man in a way that I don't feel he's ever been kind of seen. He's definitely never been portrayed in uh, in cinema before. So how do you feel that that kind of, that worked in this and that elevation and how, uh, like kinda, for people who haven't read the comics, can you kind of give some kind of insight into the, some of the differences or some of the similarities or, or what you what your own reflections were? Um, I thought what they did was very interesting because Spider-Man's rogue gallery is shit. It is not up to the power of guys like Batman. You're like, no, no, he has good bad guys. If you look at the ratio, it's quite terrible. And yeah. even some of his good bad guys aren't that great. Um, everyone has their favorite Spider-Man. Like, there's a lot of fans who like the Scorpion and the Shocker, for example. Uh, they're incredibly one-dimensional. Okay, I know they did a lot with Matt Garrett in the comics where he eventually became Venom and stuff like that. But as Scorpion himself, that's one example that I can give. The spot was lower, lower tier. I'm just dying to see what they do with the kangaroo. I mean, like if they can do this with the spot, they're going to be able to do wonders with a guy who can bounce. <laughs> really looking forward to that. But what they did with, I think, both the spot and Miguel was quite clever because going, obviously they're sticking with the multiverse thing. Granted, this is a Sony one as opposed to a Marvel, Marvel Studios one. But this whole direction they're going with a multiverse thing and having the Spider-Verse almost as a separate entity to the greater multiverse that we explored in the last Doctor Strange movie. Um, I was worried that they were going to do something like with the inheritors who were the protagonists of the comic book version of this story. And they're universally disliked. They're really zany and silly. Uh, a bunch of uh, Victorian vampires who go around the universe draining people, draining Spider Man of their powers. And it entered a lot of superstition and stuff into a story that didn't need it. So they just weren't liked by the fans. So to take the sinister aspect of them and give that to Miguel and give the universe ending aspect of them to such a nothing character like the spot was a great way to completely circumnavigate a just disliked villain, but a villain, a group of villains that's disliked for the wrong reasons, just because they're not really that interesting and they're kind of, for sake of a better word, silly. So splitting those two elements into these two characters, once again, so obvious, but at the same time, so clever in its execution and mm. um, like, yeah i liked how there's almost um a likability to the spot as well like there's a sympathetic backstory again he's kind of he's the wrong place wrong time i think there's going to be a kinship there i don't know if he's going to be the end big bads i think there's maybe a redemption article and what's to say a, a redemption arc on the way um in beyond like not he's not going to redeem himself fully but just maybe at the very end um so it's an interesting one. There's a lot of ways. And they just, they chose not to go the traditional route, as you say, which is excellent. We introduced so many like new, well, again, I say introduced, but like in terms of into this universe, uh, we met so many kind of different deviations of Spider-Man, so many references to so many things of the past. Uh, who was your favorite new introduction into this universe? Who was your, if you had to yeah. pick, go for it. I said at the end of the last thing, I've always been a fan of it because I started reading Spider-Man comics in the 90s. It was always Ben Riley, Scarlet Spider. Nice. Being in the 90s, everything was dark and moody and broody and everything was full of angst and that Scarlet Spider was the coolest thing at the time. Uh, like such a makeshift outfit, random pockets for no reason, a ripped blue hoodie over it that he really didn't need. But the design itself was just fantastic. Um, He worked at the time so to bring him in in such a satirical way, like when you first meet Ben Riley, he's leaning against that pole and he's like, oh, that was a particularly painful memory. 
that's exactly what he was like in the comics, but it felt organic back then because yeah. that's what everyone was like. I mean, <laughs> it was the era of grunge and angst, so right. he worked. He does not work nowadays, so to make him so comical was absolutely fantastic. As one of my favorite characters, one of my favorite obscure characters, I was absolutely over the moon. That scene as well in the alleyway, like it was just, it, he, like, he pulled it out of an Al Rio comic. He just nailed it. It was absolutely, I was so stoked to see him. And I thought he was going to be a cameo. I thought he was going to swing in. There's the Spider and he's gone. Right, that's all I wanted. To get so much more as a genuine fan, I'm over the moon. I just hope he's back in the next one. Yeah, and, and look, again, a lot of it will just depend on reactions and and people kind of echoing what you're saying there. I thought he was brilliant. I love Pritchard. I thought he was absolutely fantastic. Spider-Man India. I, I love the whole riff on uh, Chai Tea. It's just tea tea mm-hmm. or naan bread. You're just saying bread, bread. 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 <laughs> absolutely amazing. And again, reminded me of Visions. There was that throwback to, again, very similar to the, the episode of the Indian Jedis and Visions. Uh, and it's like, you know, it, this works. I don't know what this is, but there's a synergy here where this absolutely works in a way that I really want to see a whole Spider-Man India kind of breakout. I'd love to see a spin-off movie or even like a Disney Plus TV show or something like that. Um, what I loved about it was I was listening to an interview with co-director Kent Powers. He was on X-Ray Vision podcast uh, this week and he spoke about how they wrote a first draft that involved Spider-Man India and they then brought in an entire Indian writing team to re write that character and punch it up so that it felt authentic to the Indian viewers as well and uh, like again obviously I can't speak for it but it did feel legitimate it didn't feel like pandering it, it didn't is. feel at any time stereotypical it just felt like oh like this guy he happens to be Indian but he's cool like he's just sound he's funny he's the most charismatic character on the screen right now he's yeah. chewing scenery um, well nowadays when you get a character like that in you do get that oh god is this going to be yeah. going down the route of culture appropriation like you know is it going to make someone uncomfortable is it going to be very biased I mean uh, being Irish, we're subject to cultural appropriation every single St. Patrick's Day. It's like, no, we don't live on rainbows and we don't go around looking for pots of gold, but <laughs> whatever, we'll deal with it. Yeah. So, I do feel for like a lot of people who are maybe like kind of feel like that they're exploited by watching this, but even just seeing a character like that, it didn't feel like satirical or disrespectful. Um, I, I really, really liked them, even what they did with Spider Punk and his cocky yes. slang was bang on. And like Spider-Punk, to be honest, which irritated the shit out of me in the comics. I just did not like him. And everyone, I felt jumped on the bandwagon because he looked kind of cool. What they did in this, I wasn't really looking forward to seeing him, but they brought him up. His coolest level went up significantly with the slight difference they had with the costume. And the fact that he looked like Maximum Reality from the Progeny was absolutely fantastic. I really marked out for that. Um, absolutely. I, 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 I don't think there was any bad character in it. There wasn't. There's characters you would love to hate, and there's characters you hate because they're irritating. And absolutely nothing in this irritated me. Even the, the worst of the worst Spider Man characters were hilarious. Like uh, the Peter parked car, like <laughs> from like the toy line. The one thing I'm bummed that we didn't get to see, which I was talking to one of the guys I work with, was Spider's Man. I'm not sure if you're familiar, is a Spider Man outfit with millions of actual house spiders in it. <laughs> so it's spiders with the power of a human. Um, Animation wise, I'd say that would be a nightmare. Like the yeah. poor bastards who had to draw them in the comic, I feel for them. But I kind of did want to see Spider's Man. <laughs> <laughs> amazing amazing uh who knows there's still another one there's a part two still to come i what i, what I loved about this and yeah shout out to daniel kaluuya for his portrayal of, of hobie spider punk absolutely fantastic nailed it uh, and a really effective character um and, and played like complex like again there was that whole thing where miles is jealous obviously because he hears gwen's leaving her toothbrush in his in his universe and stuff like that yeah what's and, going on with that yeah it's totally the guy your girlfriend tells you not to worry about but you just totally worry um and it's great but also then it's that guy who's so sound and so cool you actually can't hate him which is just a really layer character to get into such 
again, they just don't, didn't have much room for anything here, but I'm so impressed by how within two hours, 20 minutes, the film zipped by and felt like an hour long. By the time to be continued came up, I'm like, what the fuck? Because like, mm. it just felt like the movie was getting started, but it was two hours, 20 minutes. But then when you think about it, they managed to give a lot of the important characters a lot of time and you, you can't feel of what more they could have done, but also gave you at the same time, like, oh, I wanted so much more of that. Oh, I wanted so much more of that in a good way. Um, and, and again, like, but just fantastic. And again, Avengers, like the Infinity War and Endgame is the only thing I can think of that managed to get that balance so right where you're getting enough of the characters that feels like they're paid off, but like you also want more of them. So fantastic yeah. stuff. We're kind of getting into similar now and there's a lot of blink and you'll miss it Easter eggs. Was there any in particular that kind of stood out to you? Uh, I, I know you've kind of touched on a couple there, but any others that you want to kind of call out? Oh, good question. Um, let me have a really quick, quick trick to every guy. Uh, like I said, like if you really kind of like there was obviously uh, we had like uh, Ultimate Spider Man. I was keeping an eye out for certain iterations, like uh, Superior Spider Man, which is obviously a crazy one. But the one thing that we did see, which really fed into the fan theory from Homecoming, was um, God, the actor's name escapes me, Charlie Gambino. I know it's his rap name. Uh, being like in canon now, he's the Prowler, which ties directly to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and that the phone call he made was obviously to Miles in the Marvel Universe. Very interesting, because that was pure fan service, but seeing where to go with that is going to be uh, really, really interesting. Um, any people out there who want to fill in the gaps for this and maybe get excited for uh, Beyond the Spider-Verse, I would definitely recommend reading the Spider-Verse cartoon itself, or excuse me, comic book itself, uh, because that will expand a lot of the characters that you've been introduced to, like spider Boy, for example, and stuff like that. You'll really get like a good sense of these characters because there's a lot of mini stories in that saga that will just suddenly stop story, story dead in its tracks, give you a quick backstory over maybe six or eight pages and then get back into the nitty grit of it. Um, like I said, they kind of had some missteps in the comic, but I still recommend reading it. And then there's a lot of add-ons that like Sp uh, spider Geddon, spider Armageddon, I can't remember what it's called exactly, that will follow up from there. So um, there there was a lot, in, I'd say there's a lot in mists, and I definitely want to check that out. I was looking for a lot of callbacks to the 1994 cartoon, which is one of my favorites still. I absolutely still think that just nailed the whole Spider-Man thing so well. It's become very memeable recently, but it's like one of those things that lose itself because it gets memeable, but that is just a killer one. Uh, didn't see any direct reference to that, but a lot of the other Spider-Man cartoons, they were a reference and you could see those characters in the background. But it's a, something I want to watch again and definitely keep an eye out for. Because when he first got into the lobby of the of the Spider-Man building he was in, I escaped me if there was a name of it, I was suddenly, like my eyes were darting around <laughs> and then I realized I was missing stuff because I was looking yeah. for things that weren't supposed to be your focal yeah, uh, it was, and there's one else. It's gonna reward or preview. And there's a few, some of which I picked up first time, some of which I needed to be pointed out to my research. I love the hints that it's gonna blend with the MCU. Um, and there was a few here, yeah. like obviously Donald Donald Glover's Prowler was the big one. Uh, the Doctor Strange reference to the No Way Home mm -hmm. events. They blatantly call that out. Obviously, a shout out to Robtimus Prime on Reddit, uh, who came up with a brilliant one. I'll, I'll kind of give you the cliff notes. Uh, who pointed out that before we see the Web of Life Spider Verse, uh, Miguel shows the Marvel Universe exactly as it's depicted by Disney and Marvel Studios in the likes of Endgame, mm -hmm. Loki, and Quantum Mania. Which from that as well, what we kind of can deduce is that the Marvel Multiverse connects the Multiverse and the Sony Verse. Um. And it's now going to connect with True Deadpool 3. That means it's going to connect the 20, 20th century Fox multiverse as well. Um, Doctor Strange, uh, Doctor Strange is, uh, was name dropped in the Sony film post 2004, which means Sony had to get approval from Disney. Uh, it added the multiple Spider Man name drops in Multiverse of Madness and Quantum Mania, which is the first time Spidey has ever been mentioned in the film he wasn't in, which means Sony had to approve. Uh, the way that uh, Toby and, An and Andrew had live action cameo scenes, mm -hmm. uh, albeit in clip shows, and then obviously Donald Glover as well. So, what that tells us that 
uh, Sony and I, I love the way he signs off on this. He goes, I think Sony and Disney Marvel Studios are now a married couple. The fans won, which is exactly what we wanted. Yeah. That's like nailed it. Um, I loved a few others. There was Ganky who was playing uh, Spider-Man 2 on PS. When uh, yeah. if you look closely, you can see it in the background. Also, what I loved was the, the corporate synergy was fantastic. And again, I'll, I'll, I'm a sucker if you get this right. Uh, Lego Spider-Man, but also tie it in kind of the Lego movie for Sony. Uh, I yeah. loved it. Bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> I really got a huge laugh. Yeah. That was in. Uh, so fantastic stuff. But I can't wait to go back now. When you know the plot, you can actually go looking around. Um, so I can't wait for a, a second watch. Um, we've discussed a couple already. Uh, obviously, we didn't get any Tom Holland. We did get a look at Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, but they were only in clip form. Um, but again, I'm, I'm I'm okay with that. Again, I thought that would have been excessive and kind of weighed down on this movie. I wouldn't mind if they did it in the right way and beyond. But was there anyone that you were hoping you saw here that we haven't discussed already or anyone that you have on your wish list that we, again, we haven't covered uh, that you hope we get and beyond? Or where do you stand even on getting the likes of Tom Holland and so on? That's one thing that came to me as I was leaving the cinema, which is when we were walking over to our bus. And because, like what you already uh, touched on the whole thing that Miles is now uh, like a rogue Spider-Man and I am I've been theory crafting just myself constantly as to where they're going to go with Tom Holland now that he is back to like a, a very traditional comic book Spider-Man he's very much on his own um, like we saw him like you know doing his GED and stuff at the end if they do really decide to bring these together and this is really like tinfoil hat territory is Tom Holland Spider-Man somewhat of an outcast himself now because of the Doctor Strange spell? Is he outside of Spider-Verse because of some glitch in the spell? The fact that no one knows who he is. Like we know that Spider-Man exists in the Marvel Universe still. He's there. No one knows who he is. No one has a memory, including the Sorcerer Supreme, but Tom Holland's Spider-Man himself. So if things do ever come together, is that going to be the the thing that's going to tie both Miles and the, the Marvel Studios, Peter Parker, together because they're both, like, Miles wasn't supposed to exist because his spider came from Universe 42 and because Peter nearly broke the multiverse and the spell not only had to eliminate him from everyone else's memory but fix the damage that was done. Is that going to put him into a special category as well? So now you have like the Spider Verse in the center, and you have Miles on one side and Marvel Studios Peter Parker on the other side. Is there something going to go there? Is there something there in general? Like I could be talking shit, I could be really reaching for something that's not there, or maybe hopefully if the Marvel Studio writers, which we know definitely watch this podcast, going shit, Dan rumbled it. <laughs> you got us. You signed up here. There you go. Um, Sorry, guys. Amazing. Yeah, but like, I, I don't think we're going to see. So uh, indulge me a little bit. I had my theory for what was going to happen next um, after No Way Home when it comes to Tom Holland. So I don't think we're going to get him in beyond. I think what's going to happen with Tom Holland's character is he's on his own in New York. Everyone's forgotten about who he is. He starts going out and being a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Though obviously from Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness, we know that people still know who Spider-Man is. They just mm -hmm. don't know who Peter Parker is and the, the relevance and the tie-in. So you can still have him be an active Spider-Man and he kind of keeps his notoriety from that. I think what's going to happen is because Tom Holland's entire arc has been about home, no way home, trying to get far away from home. You know what I mean? So he's always trying to, um, he's always trying to get home and he's always trying to be with uh, Zendaya, with Ned as well. So, I think what's going to happen is he's going to encounter Miles, but in his universe, and he's yes. going to teach Miles the tricks of the trade. And he's going to, it'd be similar to the Spider Man kind of video game. Uh, That's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, and it's going to be, he's going to teach, but then that means he can go home because he's trained up a new Spider-Man. So um, I think that's what's going to happen. And I think having him in here muddies that water. So I don't think, I think it's too messy. I, I agree. I don't think he'll be in it as well. I think there will be a connection in line because still, without interrupting you, then we'll get back to what yeah, you were no, saying. Your grand, your it still feels like they're doing a lot of uh, house cleaning that there was so much convolution in every past iteration. Absolutely every single version of these stories is now being brought into its own cinematic universe to the point where the comics have their standards uh, timeline and then everything else is a branch or a tributary from that. And it seems like they're trying to do the same with the movie. So yes, these movies all exist. Um, all of these plot holes can be explained because 
just cause there are different universes, whatever, fuck it. But I think with Miles being such a fan favorite and has been for like a long time now, especially in the comics, that it is in their best interest to have him in some form in whatever the standard iteration of the story going forward is, which it looks like obviously it's going to be the Marvel mm-hmm. uh, Studios version. So they need to, I think getting Miles into that is going to be in their best interest. And maybe we don't know what's going to happen now. We know there's going to be a third one for sure. Uh, is that going to tie it all up? Because the home uh, trilogy does feel like that's wrapped up and where they're going to go forward with new Spider-Man movies. Of course there will be. Making Spider-Man movies after we're all gone. But even though it may be the same Spider-Man, it's, it's going to continue on with its own story. With that having wrapped up in this one, looking like it's coming to a crescendo, I think it's the perfect time to bring what are two characters that work very, very well together because it's not your Batman and Robin dynamic. Even and they're both Spider Man, but they both work together to Miles and Peter and via the computer games, the comics, and now the movies with this extension of the Spider Verse, it, it works. And it's, I think it's in their best interests to just have Miles as much of a household name that he's becoming as. Peter Parker always has been for the wider, maybe not comic book aficionado audience. Yeah. And, and again, like it's such a, we've seen Peter's story told. We're now in the third run of Peter Parker's in the past, like couple of decades alone. Um, so now it's time to kind of give a live action new models and stuff like that. And as well, you, you could play into that. Like I could see Tom Holland or something like that being, I could see it being a post credit sting of beyond, but that's about it. I think we are getting Andrew Garfield or Tobey Maguire in some form simply because they've been teasing us with this since the start of the first of into the spider verse, like mm-hmm. kind of going, look, we're the same universe. Come on. It's, it's right there. Like, so um, I think we're going to get it in some form, even if it's kind of brief, even if it's a cameo, you can't, do too much because then you'd be stepping on what happened in No Way Home and it's been done so um, but I, I, I also think we're going to get a new series of movies with Andrew Garfield as well uh, in the future so uh, we shall see anyway uh, we, we were kind of speaking about uh, I'm really detoured by talking about the theories that I came out of No Way Home with is there anything again fresh out of the oven I appreciate so but is there anything that thoughts that you have about with the cliffhanger ending to be continued? Is there anything about where where you think it might go and beyond? Are you still kind of ruminating on that side of things? I'm very much still ruminating on that. I just just did not know. Um, I really do stay away from Reddit message posts when I'm going fresh into a movie like this. Uh, I am an avid spoiler avoider. Yeah. Uh, Being both of us wrestling fans, we grew up doing it very, very well. And because in like the early days, we had to wait a full week to watch wrestling on a Friday night after it had been live on a Monday. So we are expert spoiler dodgers. You know, this yeah. current generation has no clue how difficult we had it back <laughs> in the day. So I will always make sure that I don't know what's going on. So I don't know if there was anything leaked about the fact that it was going to um, be a to-be-continued ending. And I guess in that vein, I'm very much unprepared. Uh, I'm, there's a lot of titles I'm going to go back and read and see if I can pull anything out of that. Because even though they're diverging from the source material, you can see the source material still exists. Mm. So there's a lot of titles I'm going to go back and read. Um, obviously, as a fan, there's a lot of things you want to see, but it's completely unrealistic. Um, I just I know what I want to see more now. I would like to see what they've teased upon with Miguel O'Hara's vampiric powers. Are they going to stay true to the 2099 comic? Or once again, are they going to go maybe more into the Inheritors? Are they going to bring the Inheritors into the story like at all? Because they're still there. Like they, like I said, they're they're disliked, but they, they have become an important part of the comic book franchise. Um, but with this whole uh, element of the non-Spider-Man universe, that's what I'm going to ruminate on most as to what they can do with that. Like, what is the broader scale of things than not having a Spider-Man in a universe where they've established that you have to have a Spider-Man in a universe? It's this overarching destiny, which obviously you're calling canon events, but it's just like this connected destiny. If that universe doesn't have a Spider-Man, what other things have happened that we're not thinking about now because it's, it, like I said, it's so fresh? So that's the stuff I'm going to think about and then what they can do with that, where they're going to go. Um and how are they going to bridge between 
it's going to be very obvious where they can find out which universe Miles is in because they know where his spider came from. But how are they going to get there? What's it going to take? What's it going to cost them? Uh, yeah, there's a lot to think about. But my, my first thing is I'm going to go back and I'm going to reread a lot of specific titles to see what I can pull out of that. I'm going to check. Uh, and if anyone wants to do the same, Spider-Verse is going to be the first read. I'm going to read Ultimate Fallout. And oh, who knows after that? I'm going to have to start pulling out a few old books and see what I can come up with. If you have a list, tweet us that because, and then we'll put yes. it up on our Twitter as well. Because I think there there will be a lot of people who want to go away and kind of dig into it in the same way that a lot of people did mm. after Infinity War to kind of get some clues for how Endgame were pan out. You know, obviously Actually, it was it was different. Yeah, right? it was. But there was there was one I just did think of to answer one of your questions earlier that I picked up on that I'm not sure if many other people would. There's there in Spider Man Five Hundred the comic book. It's a very interesting story where Spider fell into a time. Spider Man fell into a time anomaly. And basically had to go through his entire existence again as Doctor Strange pulled him through time. But it wasn't that he was reliving past memories. He was actually back temporarily in the moment. And he could have changed the universe as he went along. But it was in there for such short periods. He couldn't do anything. So the first time he encountered all of his uh, all of his villains... Um, he found himself on top of the Brooklyn Bridge where he could have saved Gwen Stacy. He was in these moments. He could have affected it. But he tra- he travels right through his entire story. But what they do, and it's it, it's maybe ponder a lot of story for a long time. It They brought him up to the last moment of his existence, which is which they don't explain. He's standing at Mary Jane's grave. There is a nameless police captain standing at him, a bunch of cops around him with guns drawn. He's wearing this unusual leather outfit with no webs on him. And he just stares at Mary Jane's gravestone and says, I know you're there. It'll all be okay. That Spider-Man was in Spider-Verse very briefly in the background. So I was like, okay. And fans don't talk about that scene in Spider-Man 500 that much. And it's one that is just, it was very powerful. It was very broody, very moody. It was like raining. It was very emotional, but it had no explanation. That Spider-Man was there for a split second. This, uh, I can't remember, what would you call him? This uh, Omega Spider-Man, this uh, Destiny Spider-Man. It was, it's supposed to be the last story in Spider-Man's life. Mm-hmm. So he was out there beginning when he was first bitten. He was there at the very end where something happens that results in the end of the Spider-Man story. Really interesting. Uh, because he was there, I don't think it means anything. But I picked up on that and I was like, okay, what does this mean? If you really want to like, you know, be nitty gritty with the theory crafting. Okay, interesting. I think I think you're on the right lines when you're talking about kind of canon. I think that's very much central to it. I don't think they're, the conclusion is going to be, yes, canon is important and you can never change it. <laughs> I also yeah. think there's going to be something said for the Miles being the prowler. I don't, like, I think there's going to be an element of Miles is always going to be Miles and be somewhat of a hero there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the hero's journey. And kind of even if you turn left and there is no Spider-Man there, he still is Miles Morales. Also something about him being the Prowler and Spider-Man not existing and kind of Miles being kicked out of the Spider-Verse. They may demythologize the concept of Spider-Man as well in terms of saying it doesn't matter if there's no Spider-Man because Spider-Man isn't the, it isn't it isn't the suit that counts. It's you know what I mean? That guy and go with that kind of old superhero trope. It's like the whole Spider-Man thing is anyone could be in the suit, you know what I mean? Um, but it's about the, the character behind the person in the suit. And I find yeah. it really interesting how even throughout this, they tend not to go with like Spider-Man India or Spider Punk. They don't go with Spider Woman. They do mention those names, but they call him Gwen, they call him Pivtra, they call him Hobie. You know what I mean? They are their mm-hmm. own individual identities. And I think there's going to be something to that where I don't think that the Miles in Earth 45 is going to be the villain. I think he's going to actually end up, he's still Miles Morales and he was always going to be Miles Morales. He may have just taken a wrong turn here or there. So I think that's going to be where we go, how we get there. Who the yeah. fuck knows? And and, and again, like the, the thing I love about these movies is the journey that they bring you on to get to that destination. They are absolute masters of their craft and this is a masterpiece. And the more I think about it, the more I love it. Uh, I'm doing my top 10 favorite movies of 2023 so far next week and this has made that very very interesting indeed um before we wrap up uh just real quick and again like 
Again, we're, we're fresh out of the oven here. I'm not going to hold you to these. We're doing the summer of Dan Lynham. So if you have any revisions, we're going to be catching up on the regular over the next few weeks. So don't worry. This isn't, but just like kind of in your own thoughts right now, coming out of the screen and how would you kind of rank this? And you can take that to mean however you want. Like it can be Spider-Verse movies. It can be in terms of just Marvel or overall superhero movies. It could be if it's on your all-time list, you know, is it there? Like where where is this kind of sitting for you in terms of great movies? Okay, it's, I, I came out of the cinema with the same feeling. I came out of the cinema with, well, I wouldn't say no, that's not accurate. We're close to Infinity War, Dark Knight, and, um, and The Matrix. There are three movies when I came out of the cinema the come down from those cinemas was quite surreal. And it's, so you, do, you don't expect the movie to hit you as hard as it did. I thought this was going to be a fun romp. And I think I, I think there should be a lot of people out there that don't like the fact that it's been to be continued. And I think that actually almost added to it. So we'll keep it just in Spider-Man movies alone because I need time to definitely think back on that. And I loved, it might be a bit of a hot take, I loved No Way Home. It's going to be taking a top spot for me. Okay. This one's going to be tied for second place with the other Spider Verse movie. Um, mm. Because I just genuinely don't know what's better. I really think I just watched uh, Into the Spider Verse, or uh, sorry, um, the first Spider Verse movie last night. I'm going to watch it again very, very soon in the next few days to really reflect on what's better. I think this one might get another cinema visit, uh, yeah. which I don't do a lot anymore, but I think this one is going to get it. So it's tied for second place with it. Uh, I'm going to cheat as well, just to kind of give everyone a, a, an idea for third place, because they did this once. I don't give a shit. I'm classing it a Spider-Man movie. The 1994 three-part Venom uh, one, it's a little bit over an hour, three parts. They showed it on TV once as a, like a mini TV movie, I think it was on RTE. That's going to be in third place because, God damn it, that was a good cartoon. <laughs> uh, and if anyone enjoyed that 1994 cartoon as much as I did, because it's exceptional. That'll give you an idea of kind of where I rank it because that was good TV. It really, really was. Okay. So, uh, yeah, um, like I said, I've been over critical of Spider-Man movies in the past. When I first went to see the first Spider-Man movie, the to- Tommy Wire one, in 2001, I came out of cinema disappointed because my expectations were too high. Um, I remember shouting at someone about how crap the movie was when I saw the third one to be after that. Um, I don't know if Sam Raimi's a hero or a villain for that, <laughs> but like the poor guy had his hands tied. It's gonna be it's gonna be a tie for second place for the time being, as far as all Spider-Man movies go. Uh Sony movies, it's gonna be ridiculously high, I think. Um because I do class that the Spider-Man home yeah. uh, trilogy as a Marvel movie. Yeah, even though of course it's in the, the Sony it's, it's under the Sony umbrella, yeah, but yeah, so that's it. So um, it's going to be very, very high in the Sony movies, including all the X-Men ones, Deadpool and stuff like that. I absolutely love it, and okay. I'm dying to see it again. Okay. For me, Spider-Verse is just... If Indie War is my favourite superhero movie of all time, Spider-Verse is my favourite Spider-Man movie of all time. No Way Home is like top 10 MCU movie. So again, like you're talking, Spider-Verse is probably ahead of every superhero movie apart from Infinity War and Endgame and maybe throw the Dark Knight in there. Like, you know what I mean? As, as, as well, it's, it's, it, they're all in the mix. This, I feel, again, I say it is half of a perfect movie. The only reason I'd rank Spider-Verse ahead of it is just because it's a whole movie. It has a beginning, middle, and end. It tells a full story. You can watch it in one sitting. This would be something that, and I would gladly do it because I believe Beyond the Spider-Verse is going to be just as excellent as any of them. Um. I will watch them back to back because I'll have to. You're not leaving me on to be continued when I have them both available to, to myself. Um. So I'd say when you compare the two, like this and beyond, I'd say that's going to be better than Into the Spider-Verse. But Into the Spider-Verse did so many and achieved so much. And like, just look mm-hmm. at what it's inspired now and how many different genres of animation are now copying what that brought. And this is, again, pushing the genre even further out. It's not just resting on a successful formula. It's trying to change the formula. The amount of work and effort that they're going to is absolutely yeah. phenomenal. I love, love, love this movie. I'm not going to say where it is on my movies for this year, but it's going to be discussed in my top 10 movies of 2023 next week, 100%. Um, but it's it, it's fantastic. They nailed it. I loved it. I love, love, loved it. I loved having another 
universal uh, Spider-Man experience in the cinema, which I thought after No Way Home I wasn't going to get again. Um, so really, really good. Absolutely loved it. And loved having this conversation with you, Dan. Yeah, blast, so you know as what? always. Let, let's continue having them. Summer and Dan line them. Let's catch up in another couple of weeks. Maybe, I, I, I don't know, just a hunch. Maybe we might say differently, but I feel like we mightn't be as high on the flash as we are on this, but we'll still hopefully have a good time and enjoy it. Um, And we'll kind of check in anyway as the DCU kind of uh, has its Nexus event and kind of uh, vaults into the next stage. So exciting times. Uh, Dan, can't wait to join. In the meantime, uh, follow Dan on socials. We're going to be tagging him in all posts here anyway and uh, yeah we'll be back for summer down line them uh, in just a couple of weeks thanks for joining us on page 180